But I mean, I started to talk more and more about not actually the models I'm building, um, but more like the kind of conceptual idea of actually trying to make commercial success with data science. You will see why. Um, two reasons, basically, because, you know, as you become like a uh, head of data science, you actually have barely any time to do any hands-on work. So, you know, the kind of models I build get less and less. Um, and I had to take all the credit. Um, I have to take all the credit for what my team does instead. Um, but also it's like you start to be responsible for actually driving value with all that data science investment. And it turns out it's extremely difficult. And there's a lot of learnings which I want to share because in the end, you know, it comes down to companies invest into data science because they want to see commercial success with it. Um, so I, when it comes to me, I mean, I'm a data scientist by profession, but I, I'm also like a techie and a geek and a passionate innovator. Um, and when it comes to like my bragging rights, which is probably why, why, why I end up on a lot of conferences, I had a successful startup. I mean, I also had not so successful startups, but I'm not highlighting my failures. So I had a successful <laughs> startup. Um, um, it's called Enerchange. It's a, it's a utility comparison website. Um, it's it's now the biggest one in Japan, so that's that's quite. I'm still surprised by that um, success. I uh, can't believe that this actually happened. Um, I also turned out to be very clever. I got myself tested, and they gave me a PhD for it. Um, this turns out to impress my parents much more than a room full of data scientists. But you know, <laughs> um, and at the moment I'm um, leading data science at Supla. Um, Supla is, is the property portal, but it's actually the Supla property group. So there's a lot of other kind of businesses like Usage, Home Track, etc. It's it's a fairly big um, operation. Um, you will see there's like there's like links to my LinkedIn and my Medium all over that um, presentation because that's that's how you find me. Please connect to me. We, um, um, reach out. Um, I love to hear you know what people think, where you have challenges, etc. All of that slides basically are a refinement of like these conversations I had over the years. Um, I'm standing on shoulders of giants, so please just feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. It's the only social media I have, um, so don't try to find me on Twitter. So let's, I guess let's start by looking ex at exhibit A, you know, what's wrong with data science and commercial success. If you look at the kind of traditional, stereotypical um, data scientist of the enterprise, there's a huge um, gap between, you know, what data scientists should do to add value to businesses and how they do these things and what the kind of infrastructure um, is they need in place to deliver value. What the kind of perception of a lot of your like boss and managers at senior levels are how you deliver this, you know, I mean, basically their, their um, idea is that you do black magic and you just generate money out of thin air. And then there's the kind of, um, well, sad reality of your day-to-day -day job, which is like meetings and meetings about more meetings and, and a little bit of hands-on time you have, you tend to firefight a lot of technical depth and issues, etc., rather than build any models. So this is not great because it basically means, you know, um, in a lot of companies, the data science team is far, far, far away from you know, how, how you can add value as, as a data scientist. And, and it's very hard to, to reach that point because there's problems in the day-to-day -day job and the infrastructure, etc. but also like the general perception of, of what is actually needed and the kind of investment levels, etc. cetera. Um, so you, um, I, I have some numbers actually to back that up. Um, so, because you know we are data people, so if you look at um, New Vantage, they published a survey at the beginning of this year, and they basically said that in their survey, 77% of the businesses reported challenges with business adaptation. Their data scientists didn't 
like not deliver anything, right? It's, they, they were busy working, which that means that translates into um, three quarter of all of these data science projects are just collecting dust because, you know, they never make it off people's laptops or into production because the business doesn't know how to adapt them. Um, Gartner was never a big data science cheerleader. Um, Back in 2017, they already reported that like 85% of big data, that's what, what the hype was back then, you know, of all the big data projects didn't really move past the discovery um, phase and they didn't get more cheerful because um, they had a survey um, they released also beginning of the year. And, and just when we look at like analytics insights, they basically say that 80% of the analytics insights will not um, deliver any business outcomes. Um, 2022. I mean, what kind of hope do you have for data science in with that? You know, so I mean, you know, it's it's you probably all now um, understand and accept that um, making data science a success is really really hard for some reason. And I mean, you could you could be like a stereotypic data scientist and say, well, why do I care about that? They pay me regardless, and. Yes, true, um, it's, it's a great time to be a data scientist, um, but you should care because um, we all know the hype cycle and I don't need to like point out where we currently are. I mean, we are at that peak of the, of the data science hype. Um, we have the perfect storm of like um, um, big visibility, even now in the kind of mass media, a lot for the wrong reasons, like, um, Cambridge Analytica, etc. But you basically are at, at that very peak, and it comes with the inflated expectations, you know, of like how much millions you will make, um, your your um, businesses, etc. And with all your black magic um, data science, and with the current success of delivering value, we all know where where this peak goes next, and and that will be that cliff edge, and we will basically eventually. Um, crash and the question is you know who will be who will be part of that kind of reinvestment phase and businesses will look for very different people when they start to reinvest into data science different leaders different data scientists and you know so I started to talk a lot about this kind of commercial challenges around um, data science because you know in in like two or five years when the crash actually happened it looks like on, on Google like I predicted the crash so I was like <laughs> but you know it is important to to understand that problem and and start to ask these kind of questions around long-term success for data science because there, there will be a very um, strong rethink um, before the reinvestment phase happens um, where I stand at the moment, I, I see that there's like basically five bigger themes around, you know, what's needed for a long-term successful um, data science team. Um, and, you know, one, um, one is all about the original motivation of why did a business go into data science. And, and you know, it's like all about senior leadership buy-in and do they actually understand the value delivery or the value offering of data science. And that will make the make all the difference between your team being just another vanity project or actually aligned with business strategy. And unfortunately, you see too many data science teams which are just pure vanity, uh, vanity projects. There are clear preparations and requirements for data science. And you know, it's like, a need, there should ideally be solid foundations for your data science team to build on and not just a lot of firefighting and duct tape all over um, like, historic legacy problems, etc. you know, data infrastructure, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, You should look at your hiring strategy, you know, is your hiring strategy actually fit to hire data science unicorns or do you just hire a lot of expensive mishires, you know, because it's a hype, there's a lot of buzzwords, etc. You need people capable of navigating them. Um, where do you source your candidates in such a hot market? It's not that easy. Hiring is really difficult. Um, ideally, you say, start to think a little bit about delivery into production um, because that's what you want. You want to have your models in production and not just undocumented models on laptops, which happens way too often. And and you know this this is like 
this covers things like platforming, right? Um, automation, data ops, all this um, new thinking. And, and then obviously retention, you know, you want to have a roadmap of game-changing game projects and not an abundant team in 12 months. And, and I tend to talk always about the delivery aspect. I mean, there's a lot of um, material you can find online about culture and hiring strategies, etc. Um, so I tend to talk a lot about the most technical aspect of data science, um, which is the delivery, but also because there's a, there's a close connection to retention, which you hopefully will see um, at the end of this presentation, because the, the most humane thing you can do to your data scientists is solve the technology problems and give them uh, proper platforms and scalable delivery pipelines, because that's how you will retain them long term. So. When, we, when you tend to ask people in the data science field, what is the problem with data science? You know, why is it not delivering? You usually tend to get something around that line, you know, that 80% of data science is finding, cleaning, and preparing data. It comes out of some survey from 2016. The same survey also said that 60% <coughs> of these people claim that this is the um, least like part of their job. Um, and it became like a universal problem statement for what's wrong with data science. And that's unfortunate because nothing, that's, that's not the problem. Um, but I can show you why it's so appealing and why people tend to talk about this a lot. And I mean, if we look at like some kind of data science workflow, um, I, I, use, um, I always use the cross-industrial standard process for data mining. It's from 1996. So predates like our today's definition of data science, but it is a perfect <coughs> data science workflow. Um, just shows you, you know, that data science didn't come out of nowhere. You know, there's, um, it builds on on like years of like statistics, um, data mining, etc. And obviously, some things have changed since '96. I mean, um, there's there's many more data silos now. Um, so I added in a few more of them, and the kind of back and forth in, um, between the data preparation and the modeling step um, um, grew in, in like the kind of time you spend on it and the kind of amounts of effort you actually spend on just preparing your data. So it's, it's not surprising that people caught on to that 80 20 rule and were like, oh yeah, I spent like so much time here and I hate that part, right? Um, there's some more updating I had to do, but you know, when, when I get started, it's hard to stop me. So because realistically, your data is on fire. Um, at least in my team, you know, there's a lot of very full language coming from the people who currently try to prepare data. And, and personally, when I look at that very innocent box saying deployment, I, I, get, I laugh a lot because, you know, it's like, as I always say, I mean, one day it will come all back and and, and haunt me and I've become an internet meme, but you know, you don't just deploy data science. Um, why not? So what's actually the challenge? Um, if you remember one thing from this entire talk, it's like nothing, data science is not, um, um, it's not hard to make data science a success because 80% of your time is data preparation. It's, it's really hard to make it a success because Productionization of models is actually the toughest problem in data science, and it's not talked about a lot. And so why is that so difficult, right? It's like when we actually look at data science, um, you don't just deploy data science. Data science in production is a living, breathing beast that has a life cycle. Um, data drifts, um, so you constantly have to monitor and evaluate your model's performance. Um, you have to retrain it to keep it um, um, relevant for you know the changing world out there. Um, at the same time, you know when you develop your model, you do that against historic data. There are no guarantees that in production your model will behave exactly as you predicted based on doing all your due diligence in um, in development against historic data. So models in production are living, breathing beasts. They have life cycles. You need to manage that. And, and that's what makes it so challenging. And, you know, if you have a team which is productive, it doesn't take very long. And, you know, whatever you've done with, with that, 
you know, maybe IT solved it, you know, moved that one model into production and maybe ignored all that life cycle. It doesn't take long and you start to have a challenger model. Um, and it's basically the same, you know, it has the same kind of complexities and you already start to like think about not solving it once, but start to scale this problem. Um, and how do you tend to evaluate the performance of a challenger versus your production model, right? A lot of businesses look at A-B tests. It's, um, it's like the default to assess any of this kind of situation. So you basically have like most kind of e-commerce companies, etc., have some kind of tooling to have a um, smart traffic split, <coughs> which is like 10% of your traffic um, through your challenger model, right? And then 90% and then to production, and then you just find out how good your challenger is. But actually, how do you compare these two models? Isn't that straightforward? Imagine if that's a personalization engine or a recommendation engine, then the results these two customers see are personalized. They're very different. So how do I compare the output of a model for that customer versus that one? It's not that straightforward. And there's another thing which, when you're around for a while, you start to see is, well, not every challenger model actually works and is better. A lot of times it looks much more like that and you just basically expose 10% of your valued customers to a bad experience because your model isn't actually that good. And, and if your customers aren't angry, it's some manager um, whose KPIs you just destroyed, right? So not ideal, there, there should be better ways of testing um, models and experiment with new ideas and your data scientists will depend a lot on on this kind of way of testing and experimenting so there need to be better ways to do that um, you think that's already a lot of problems well all of that just like gets more and more complex because the reality is that you know your team looks a little bit more like that you know you have your people who write python and then you have people who write an r and then you have all these different frameworks and and if you wanted to up um, keep that slide up to date you have to add a new framework um, almost on a weekly basis so the the kind of growing complexity of the data science toolkits just gives every it department a proper run for their money because how the hell do you manage all that so I don't want to just give you problems. <laughs> it's a lot of problems. Um, this is the first part of the solution. And this is like your checklist of requirements. If you want to have a data, successful, commercially successful data science function, and we're not just talking about like a nice value add to your core products, but data science is supposed to become like core and center of, of your data driven or data enabled business. Um, then these are the requirements any solution needs to meet. You need to be able to evaluate a big number of um, challenger uh, um, models in, in parallel. Um, you need to manage that model life cycle we just saw. You need to be able to handle that increasing complexity of all the data science toolkits um, in production. Um, I'm a big fan of like experimentation and production. That's the key to productivity. You need to be able to allow this experimentation in production without impacting the user experience. And important, you need to decouple the business objective to provide a consistent, stable experience to their, to their customers from the data science objectives to play around with them, you know, and experiment and, and do all these things like breaking experiences. Um, you also obviously have to start to look at decoupling enterprise requirements at some point because there are challenges with like um, authentication, SLAs, GDPR. You don't want to push that into your data science um, function. You want to keep that far away from them. And if you are like a business like the scale of Supply, you need to be able to, to scale it up to like peaks of 50,000 page loads per minute without hiring armies of DevOps engineers. Right, so the interesting thing is all these are technological challenges, right? Not a single one of them is scientific. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, um, that's just how it is. So there are solutions to that. Um, there's a few um, emerging kind of think, um, ideas and thinking around doing data science in production. Um, the one I champion 
it's called rendezvous architecture. It's, it's nothing I came up with. Um, again, standing on these shoulders of giants. So this is um, this was a white paper which um, Ted Dunning and Alan Friedman published in their book uh, Machine Learning Logistics and big tens of them, you know, very, very capable, intelligent engineers, you know, very much ahead of their time in their thinking. And when I read that book, it was just like, of course, that's how you do it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about rendezvous architecture. So at the core of, of their kind of white paper was basically the idea that when you have requests coming in, you know, you should publish them onto a message stream and treat, um, treat them as a stream of requests. And basically, as soon as you do that, as you can use PubSub messaging systems, which have been around for a long time, to basically subscribe models to your requests. And just by treating your requests as a stream means you can easily distribute requests to um, a big number of models in parallel. So that first kind of requirement is, is ticked off by treating your request as a stream. Um, obviously, there's still a problem you need to like formulate a response and you now have all these different models producing scores you st still have to fill in something to to create a response at the end um, and the simple enough to just say yeah well publish all your scores um, to a stream again of, of scores and then the uh, propose the name giving rendezvous process um, which subscribes to both the input stream and the score st um, stream. And why would you do that? It's because with that, you actually just decouple the ability to reply um, to a request from your models ever producing a score. Because God forbid, you know, your models all go down or, you know, it takes too long and the SLA is like 200 milliseconds and your models are all taking their time to produce scores. The rendezvous process saw the original request coming in, which means even if no score reaches the process, it is aware of the original request and it can produce a response. Like you can implement, basically decouple that ability to respond, which means you can put in policies um, in there, like wait for 200 milliseconds for my preferred production model. If not, send a meaningful default, right? So this is basically, this is where you that decoupling where you basically get a lot of freedom to build business logic into that process, um, decouple sensitive parts of the process like looking up personal data and enrich your scores with email addresses, something like that. So that kind of rendezvous process and decoupling it from the models is key to deliver a lot of the value. Obviously that's a very simplistic kind of idea if you translate that into an actual platform, it gets a little bit more complex. <laughs> this is this is the kind of diagram of the um, platform I wrote for Supla. And yes, there's a lot of more detail and I never have time to really talk about this um, in um, specifically, but you know, there's, there's, if you look at like a proper production platform, you have requirements like a canary model and a decoy model, you need to have like um, proper locking and you need to have some kind of metrics and dashboards to like do health checks etc and know what's going on in your platform and <coughs> obviously some of your data science models are stateful models they have a state so you need to like find a way how do you um, combine stateful models with like a microservice um, inspired architecture but there are solutions to that um, and even so I never have time to talk about it, I wrote a long article about it. So you can read about all the technical details of that platform um, under that link. I also share some code. I mean, I'm, I think I, I probably um, will um, open source the entire implementation of the architecture um, next. I'm still, I'm still undecided and have to probably talk with legal team, uh, the legal team at Supla about that. But I think, yeah, this, um, the code base should probably go open source, so probably can have all the code at some point. But otherwise, the kind of key parts of, of implementing the architecture, the challenging bits are already in the article. Um, so for now, just take my word for it. Um, you know, requirement of evaluating models in parallel, easy when you have pubs up messaging. Um, handling the model life cycle, well, we just decoupled the models, we put them in containers, deploy that stuff on Kubernetes, where we build operators, and that gives us data ops APIs, 
and you can deploy canary models, etc. Um, the complexity of the data science toolkits solved because we just put it in containers, it becomes a black box. Um, the engineers do not care what happens inside. Experimentation and production, the rendezvous pattern, you know, allows easy shadow scoring um, and risk mitigation of untested models by using specific policies in which scores you actually um, send out um, as on, on a request. Um, the enterprise requirements, it's again, again exactly the same, that rendezvous pattern allows you to implement independent policies for these SLAs um, and security. You have an additional step where you can do data lookups against your customer database, etc. Um, and you can scale that obviously easily because if you have a um, stateless microservice inspired architecture on Kubernetes, scaling this is, is, is very straightforward. Hey, nothing is for free, I'm afraid. Um, so building the rendezvous architecture has a cost. Um, the cost is, is, is time. <laughs> so you pay, um, in my implementation, I pay between 40 and 50 milliseconds of overhead for, for the entire messaging part in, in the architecture. The engineers keep on promising me that they can get it down another 10 milliseconds, but then they never have time to work on it. Um, but yeah, so, for most businesses, that's acceptable. Um, you know, 40 to 50 milliseconds usually gives you plenty of time to do actual scoring um, in what is like on a website considered acceptable like um, um, delays. So it's not for free, but I haven't seen many use cases where this is not worth paying for all the kind of um, advantages you get from the architecture. Um, just to like double back to, to that um, retention piece. Um, basically, there's an important link between having a scalable delivery pipeline, whatever it will be, whether it is a rendezvous architecture or you, you build something different, you know, and a happy data scientist. Because they want to build models, they want to solve problems. Um, if you depend on your data scientists to look after the operational challenges of your models in production, you will lose them because you know in an environment where 75 or 80 percent of the businesses don't even manage to get anything into production you know this data science to just deliver the model into production it becomes incredibly valuable and if you then want to use that talent to look after the operational challenges of your models you will not be able to retain that person um, it is um, basically, a, um, delivery technology and the retention in data science are all tightly coupled to the long-term success of data science. And that's why businesses need to start investing into proper platforming, data infrastructure, etc. Because it will be the key to having that roadmap of game-changing uh, models and happy data scientists solving these problems rather than an abundant team with um, undocumented models which start to drift in production and no one left to ever understands how they worked in the first place. So, um, yeah, credit where credit is due. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, Ted Dunning and Alan Friedman are my personal heroes. I, I um, recommend you to read um, all their books. Um, they're very easy, light, um, books um, written about conceptual ideas and then they're thinking about them and and their, their um, book about machine learning logistics is actually available for free on the MapR um, homepage and then there's Terry and Chris um, who <coughs> for a long time always believed into me gave me my kind of first commercial job and and bought into my ideas and supported them wherever they could you know with like um, giving me the room and the money to, to build certain things, etc. So they've always been early day supporters and contributors to my efforts. So I'm, I'm totally grateful um, to them. And <coughs> I publish a lot on Towards Data Science. So there's two articles which are relevant for this kind of topic about the rendezvous architecture and then like more details on these other um, five themes around how to make a success story of your data science team, a little bit more about hiring, etc., etc. And yep, that's that's me.
Thank you very much.